We had the sub on the ASDIC, and we threw everything we could in its general direction. I guess we never touched him. He needed too much luck. He'd done his job and gone. The convoy would plug ahead. We'd turn back to pick up the pieces. A cargo ship had caught one amidships, but she'd catch up. There'd been a tanker further back, and maybe a few hadn't drowned or burned or froze or choked to death on oil. Maybe we hadn't made a kill, but it would have been worse without us. Finally, you could see it, the other end. We'd secure for harbor and put on the tiddly blues and run up to Londonderry. We'd pray like mad that this ship would break down and never sail again. But she always did. And so did we. Nineteen forty one. Hitler wants oil and access to Russia. He shakes his fist. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria crawl into his camp. Yugoslavia fights gamely but falls. The Greeks, who made a mockery of the Italian army, cannot withstand the Germans. The Nazi paratrooper drops on Crete. North Africa, the Germans again rescue the inept Italians. Rommel, the desert fox, takes dead aim on Suez. For Adolf Hitler, Teutonic adoration. It is at about this time that Hitler decides on the final solution to his Jewish problem. He is fortunate in having just the man for the job, the old chicken farmer, Heinrich Himmler. Hitler had built a model camp near the Polish town of Auschwitz. The paperwork was heavy, thousands of certificates listing cause of death as heart failure. There was light music for those arriving in their boxcars and pretty picture postcards to send home. Then they waited their turn to take a bath. They were bathed in the fumes of Zyklon B, which, depending on the weather, would kill a human being in three to 15 minutes. All that left Auschwitz were gold inlays from Jewish teeth, human hair for stuffing, human ashes for fertilizer, human fat for soap. On the 22nd of June, 1941, Hitler follows Napoleon into Russia. The world, says Hitler, will hold its breath. 
In three weeks, he is within 200 miles of Moscow. The Russians scorch their earth and retreat. Joseph Stalin is now allied with the democracies. His partners meet off Newfoundland to sign the Atlantic Charter. Roosevelt was committing himself to the Allied cause. On the Atlantic, he dealt in generalities. At Hyde Park, he and Mackenzie King dealt in practicalities. They concluded an agreement for economic cooperation. The Canadian economy was now rigidly supervised. Wages were frozen. So were rents and prices. And there would be none of the profiteering of World War I. Donald Gordon's Wartime Prices and Trade Board had its volunteer watchdogs. The bustling Canadian female made vigorous reports to the boss. The other giant of the home front, Clarence Decatur Howe of Munitions and Supply. He founded Crown Corporations to handle strategic materials. His control over private war industry was complete. His speeches were short and to the point. As long as production can be kept on its present efficient basis, you need have no fear of lack of orders. Your job is to produce the planes, and mine is to see that orders are forthcoming. I expect to be able to do my part if you will do yours. Overseas, Canadian airmen were flying the lumbering Wellington bomber. Ground crews lovingly patched up their wimpies each day. For it was only in the air the Allies could take the offensive. This early bombing was strategically ineffective, but psychologically imperative. It showed the German he too was vulnerable. This was not the air war of 1418, of Bishop and Barker and Collishaw, of dashing lone wolves in open cockpits. These men fought as darkly confined teams, dependent on one another for life itself. this war, 17,000 of these RCAF flyers will die. The ground crews would count them coming back. They knew that even those who made it might have a dead man at one of the guns. There was still two-way traffic in the air. The German bombers still came at night, and 40,000 British civilians were now dead. In London, a growing Canadian colony had adopted the British attitude of business as usual. The centre of this colony was Canada House, and the titular head was the Canadian High Commissioner, Vincent Massey. Good morning, sir. The last night was a quieter one. It was a bit better, sir, yes. Well, the newspaper men are waiting for you upstairs, sir. Well, thanks very much. 